Hello and welcome to this study of the Exodus from Egypt. We are going to be in the book of Exodus. We spent uh, three lessons, lessons two, three, and four, looking at uh, Genesis. And so tonight we are actually going to make our way into the book of Exodus. We are using a Bible survey called The Big Picture. And if you don't have a copy of it, I certainly encourage you to get one. It can be found at my website, holybiblestudy.com. That's spelled W-H-O-L-L-Y. And right now I'm running a sale on the book through the end of the month, which is almost over, as a matter of fact. Normally the book retails for $23.99. If you'd like to pick up a copy for $15, it's available to you. Tonight we are in Exodus, and those of you who are watching after the fact, I appreciate so much you tuning in. Uh, those who are live, I want to encourage you to ask some questions or make some comments. I'd love for you to do that. Uh, give a shout out if you would, just like my dad did just now. So appreciate that very much. Uh, Laverne Hughes, who's not been able to worship with us uh, lately. Well, She's recovering from her recent surgery. I'm very glad that you are joining us tonight. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the place where I preach. You can go to our website, Parkway Church of Christ, and, and uh, parkwaychurchofchrist.us, and find us. Uh, the church where I, I preach uh, is here in Corpus Christi, Texas, and we strive to go by the Bible and it only. And we would love for you, if you're in the area, if you are available to, to come and, and be with us, uh, it would be a, a real treat to be able to meet you and uh, hope you will consider coming out and, and uh, worshiping with us here at the Parkway Church. Again, you can go to my, my website if you want to find some more information on, on the books. All right. Well, if you've got a Bible, that's the book you need, the Bible uh, we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, as we get started. And, and one of the things I want to point out is that Exodus is a continuation of Genesis. In fact, Genesis leaves off, or Exodus picks up where Genesis leaves off. So notice the very first verse is similar to Genesis 46, verse 8. Exodus 1 verse 1 says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. And that's a very similar language. You have all the sons listed in both of these passages, and the story continues. Uh, you have the, the 12 tribes named, and the family of Jacob is identified as 70 persons in verse 5. Well, that brings us to verse Six, and you have Joseph mentioned again. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. And that connects also with the very last verse of Genesis. Joseph died and um, we're told that he is embalmed, put in a coffin in Egypt. But what we also know from Genesis is that Joseph had commanded his family to take his bones with them. And as we make this whirlwind trip uh, through Exodus 1 through 15, we will see that indeed when, when the Israelites leave Egypt, they make their exodus out of Egypt, they take the bones of Joseph with them and they will bury them in, in the land, in Ephraim. All right, uh, verse 7 uh, tells us that Israel... <clears throat> the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. When we left off Genesis, the nation promise really hadn't been fulfilled. You had, you had Jacob's family, his 12 sons, their families, his grandkids, uh, but it's not a nation. Well, Exodus 1 verse 7 says over the the next few centuries while they're living in Egypt, they were greatly blessed by God. And I want you to notice all the verbs that are used in this single verse. Uh, five verbs, 
in Exodus 1, verse 7. Israel uh, was fruitful, increased greatly. They multiplied. They grew exceedingly strong. The land was filled with them. The story is, is getting started immediately, uh, taking us into a new chapter, a new phase of Israelite history. And this uh, event, the Exodus, cannot be overstated in its importance. This is the watershed moment in Israelite history. I will compare it to the signing of, of the Declaration of Independence when we as a nation declared our de independence, July 4th, 1776. Well, this is when Israel becomes a, a nation. Uh, these 12 tribes are going to leave together. They're going to head toward Sinai, and we'll see that in just a moment. But right now, they are in turmoil. And the reason why is because there's a new Pharaoh who has arisen who does not remember Joseph, who does not know Joseph. You know the story. I, I trust many of you already are familiar with the story. I'm reminding you of, of a lot of the details. But there may be some folks who are completely new to the story of Exodus. I hope you will follow along in your Bible and we will study this together. I'm also going to want to make references to the New Testament. And one of those is right here, Exodus 1 verse 7. Uh, the same language is used in the book of Acts to describe the growth of the church. It talks about the word of God increasing, the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. This is the exact same kind of language used and it's intentional by Luke, the author of Acts. And you see this again in Acts 7, verse 17. Uh, the people uh, increased and multiplied. This is Stephen recounting the events of Exodus 1, verse 7. And it also reinforces what had just been talked about uh, before Stephen is really introduced in Acts 6, verse 8. And the conflict over him um, pours over into Acts 7. So this is all intentional, something to, to think about and, and to study. Uh, in the remainder of Exodus, what we find out is that the Pharaoh, who does not know Joseph, Joseph does not appreciate at all what, what he did for the, the people of, of Israel, for the, for the people of Egypt. Uh, he doesn't appreciate what, what God has, has done for them through Joseph. And so he has turned them into slaves. And as a result of that, the people are oppressed. And it reaches a point because all the Israelite moms are, are having babies quickly because God has blessed them. Israel is growing as a nation. Well, Pharaoh and the Egyptians become concerned. They say, wait a minute. They are so numerous. What's going to happen when... Uh, a nation comes in and, and, and well, the Israelites uh, join them, join our enemies and, and rebel against us. So they started, they started killing the male children. And there are two midwives, two Israelite midwives who are praised in, in the end of uh, chapter one because they refused. Well, eventually Pharaoh just starts taking all the babies and throwing, throwing them into the Nile. And as you know, the Nile River is going to be filled with crocodiles. It's, it's awful. This is an evil man who is demanding that these children be murdered. Uh, a lot of argument can be made for our world today where people are killing babies. Uh, here's something else I want you to see as we come into chapter 2. I'm going to read the first couple of verses. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, uh, went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. Oh no! They're going to have a baby boy in the time when Pharaoh is killing all the baby boys. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Then we come to verse 3. When she could hide him no longer, she took she made excuse me. She took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. 
Now, I've got a citation here to Genesis 6, verse 14. Let me tell you why. Because some of the same words are used to describe Noah making the ark. Now, wait a minute. We've got a basket being daubed with bitumen and pitch. And there we had an ark being daubed with uh, pitch and, and bitumen is also used. Here's the thing. That word basket in Exodus 2, verse 3 is actually the same word used in Genesis 6, verse 14 for ark. Is, is this a big basket? Well, I, I don't think so. Rather, this is a connection being made. So just as, as Noah built this ark to save people, God, uh, his mom, uh, Moses' his mom, has, has built this basket that is going to save people as well. Isn't that interesting? And I'm going to tell you something else about um, Exodus 2, verses 1 through 10. It, look, I want you to notice verse 6 for just a moment. It, it is talking about Pharaoh's daughter who is bathing at the Nile. And that's, that's when the basket is put down the Nile. It's floating on the Nile. And Moses' sister, uh, Miriam, is watching and, and seeing what happens here. And she plays an important role. What it says is when, when Pharaoh's daughter, when she opens the basket, she saw the child, Exodus 2, verse 6, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Now, what should have happened to the baby? He should have been thrown into the Nile. Here, instead, he's floating on the Nile, and he's saved. I'm just mentioning this because I, I, I just want to point out the beautiful, powerful artistry of the Bible. Uh, I had to have this pointed out to me, but th this is fascinating. There are 70 words in Exodus 2, verses 1 through 6, until you get to the word child. Uh, the child is one word in the Hebrew text. And then after that, through verse 10, there are another 70 words. This is just part of the beautiful artistry of Exodus 2, 1 through 10, 70 words, the child, followed by 70 words. We can't see that in English, but it's, it's in the original, and it is helping us to understand how this book is not thrown together. This is not a hodgepodge. This is the inspired word of God, and it's bringing to us a story that we're reading, but yet there's a lot under the hood that is taking place. All right, let's 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 talk about Moses here. Uh, do you know who named Moses? It wasn't his mom. Um, by the way, uh, his mom's name is Jochebed. We will find that out later in Exodus. Uh, Amram and Jochebed were, were uh, Moses' parents. Do you remember who named Moses? It's Pharaoh's daughter. When she drew him forth from the water, that's what sounds like Moses, the name Moses. And so that becomes his name. And he he grows up in Pharaoh's household, in his palace. But because of the planning and conniving of Jochebed and Miriam, her, his own mother, Jochebed, ends up being his nursemaid. And no doubt she told him all about his Hebrew heritage. All right, let, let's talk about uh, Moses' life for just a moment. And this is this is, I think, going to help us as we think about uh, Moses' entire life. His life of 120 years total can be divided up into three sections of 40. And this is especially brought out in Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7. Um, I'm noticing some of you, uh, none of you have, have posted from Facebook um, I, when I when I signed on tonight, it said Facebook was having some issues. If you're watching on Facebook, let me know. But I, I uh, I'm afraid that maybe it, it didn't show up on on Facebook. So give a shout out if you're if you're watching on via Facebook. I'd appreciate that very much. All right, the life of Moses divided into three sections of forty years. Chapter two, verses one through twenty. Tell us about his life up until he was 40. What happened when he was 40 years old? He goes out 
and sees the plight of his people and he kills, he murders in cold blood a, an Egyptian taskmaster who was beating up on a Hebrew slave. He goes out the next day uh, and, and there are two Hebrew slaves fighting and Moses says, hey guys, stop that, cut that out. And, and so he's 40 years old and this Hebrew slave who's beating up on his fellow Hebrew slave says, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Are you going to kill me like you did that Egyptian? <gasps> and so Moses freaks out. Uh, Moses decides to get out of Dodge. And uh, what he ends up doing is leaving at the age of 40. And he stays in Midian, which is wilderness area. And let me show that to you on this map. So here's Midian. He flees Egypt, goes to Midian. My father says Facebook is working, so um, I'm glad for that. Uh, and, um, and so he is going to be herding sheep for his father-in-law, Jethro. Uh, just like we saw Jacob go to a well and, and find his wife, well, Moses does the same thing. So there's all these patterns, all these connections with Genesis. And Moses ends up uh, marrying his wife. Uh, and, and so he comes into the family of Jethro, who is a priest of God. He's not, a, he's not an Israelite. He's not a descendant of, of Abraham. But Jethro is a priest of God. And so this is going to be a very helpful relationship for Moses. Well, he, he was, as it were, a prince in Egypt. And he runs away. He wanted to deliver God's people when he was 40. And he says, well, guess that's not going to happen. I'm a wanted man. And he lives in Midian, which is a wilderness, which is right across from the Sinai Peninsula, which is where Mount Sinai is. And it will play prominently in the second half of Exodus, especially uh, chapters 16 through 40, or I guess really chapters 19 through 40, which finishes out the book of Exodus. Moses is in Midian, and he is going to go back to Egypt. Now, eventually, the Israelites are going to go to Canaan, and that's the land of Israel as we know it, uh, where, where the nation of Israel is today. Now, on this map, you see, uh, number one, that's where Moses was born in Egypt. Then he flees, number two, to Midian at the age of 40 and lives there from the age of 40 to 80. Then God calls him in Exodus chapter three, which we're going to start looking at here in just a moment. And so he goes back to Egypt. And this is all part of this last 40 year period of Moses' life from the time that he is 80 uh, until um, uh, over the next 40 years. And he's going to lead the Israelites uh, in the wilderness for 38 years, for a total of a 40-year period. We'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Uh, but uh, eventually, Moses will lead Israel out of Egypt, and they will go to the Sinai Peninsula. They will enter in a covenant relationship with God. We won't get to that till chapter 19. And, and in our next study next week, but then Moses will himself reach the cusp of Canaan. He will not be able to enter into Canaan. Instead, he will die and um, God will bury him on Mount Nebo on the other side of the Jordan River. And then that will give way to uh, Joshua, actually. So this will take us from Exodus all the way through Deuteronomy and the, the main human character uh, in the narrative, in the story of Exodus through Deuteronomy, is Moses. He is the great lawgiver. And every step of the way, God is leading him and directing him. So let, let me walk through that again with you. Uh, so he's born in Egypt. He travels to Midian, lives there for 40 years. Then God appears to him in Exodus 3 in the burning bush and calls him back to Egypt after that period of time, uh, he will lead Israel out of Egypt. They will make their exodus. 
thus the name of the book, the Exodus to Sinai. They will wander in this area uh, as part of a judgment from God because the people didn't didn't believe, uh, they didn't have enough faith in God to trust him. Um, and and that's, that's an important part of the, the story of Exodus. And then eventually Moses at 120 years old will travel toward Canaan and die at the age of 120. All right, that brings us now to Exodus 3. Exodus chapters 3 and 4 go together. And I'm just going to start reading here in Exodus 3. Now Moses, he's 80 years old. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb is another term for Sinai. There is a mountain range there. And there's a specific mountain. Uh, archaeologists aren't sure exactly where it is, but that's that's where, that's where uh, Moses... Uh, sees this burning bush in this area. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. So the, the narrative here has slowed down. We've got this whirlwind of events. Moses is born in chapter two, 80 years pass by, and now we slow, slow down here. Moses in, in verse 3 of Exodus 3 says, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, this is what God says to Moses in verse 5, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Let me ask you, why is this holy ground? I, I imagine Moses has probably um, carried the sheep out this way many times, uh, leading the sheep in this barren wilderness area and, and trying to find pasture for them. Well, now it's holy ground, and I'll tell you why. Because God is there. It is holy ground because God is appearing in this burning bush. And then beginning in verse 7 of Exodus 3, God says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. All right, listen to verses 9 and 10. God is still speaking. He has been speaking since verse 7. Here's verse 9. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And this 80-year-old Moses says, all right, let's go. Let's knock some heads together. Let's do this. Ooh, uh, no, he doesn't. Verse 11, Moses said to God, who am I to do this? Really? You, you want me to to do this, and what Moses proceeds to do is make a series of excuses, one after the other. And and uh, this author, as you can see on the screen, uh, gives us some eyes, some I words, alliteration of inadequacy, ignorance, incredibility, uh, inarticulateness, and insubordination. Well, um, I find that interesting. Uh, maybe a neat way to remember the five excuses of Moses. Uh, spoiler alert, God doesn't accept any of them. And the last one, when he just says, send someone else, makes God angry. We need to walk through these, these chapters, uh, excuse me, these excuses just a little bit here in Exodus chapters 3 and 4. Moses doesn't say, all right, let's go do this. He did when he was 40. And, and I think this is important. This is an important aspect of Moses' character. 
He is arrogant. He is overconfident. Yes, he is going to deliver God's people, but he wanted to do it his way. In fact, in Exodus 5, he's still going to be trying to do it his way. It blows up in his face when he goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, because he's, he's not listened to God. And so here he is now, an 80-year-old man. He's more pliable. He's more willing to let God have his way with him and let God use him in his service. But even then, Moses still has this overconfidence. Now think about Moses. For the first 40 years of his life, he lived in Egypt. He, he lived a life of luxury. The Hebrew writer indicates that to us very clearly in Hebrews chapter 11. He, he uh, grew up in, in a home where he could receive a, a world-class education. He went to uh, Egypt University, we might say. And, uh, and so Stephen, in his inspired speech in Acts 7, tells us that, that Moses was trained in all the learning of the Egyptians. He was a man mighty in words and deeds. This is a powerful leader who has been humbled because he killed an Egyptian. He fled for his life. He herded sheep for 40 additional years. When he was 40, he was like, let's do this. I, I'm ready to be be the deliver. Well, at 80, he's saying, I'm not so sure about this. And, and that's when God can actually use Moses. And that's how it is for us. God uses people when they are their most vulnerable. And we see that all throughout biblical history. Uh, you, have, you have somebody like, like Gideon who says, you know, I'm not a warrior. I mean, what can I do? I'm the from the least tribe. I'm the least in my dad's. Okay, I, I don't mean to get sidetracked, but you get the point. Moses is underconfident now. Who am I? And so God says, I will be with you. And you go to them. Uh, let me read verse 12. Uh, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I've sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain, Mount Sinai, sometimes called Mount Horeb. Well, Moses says, um, what, what do I do if they ask who has sent me to them? And then we come, that's verse 13. Then we come to the extremely important Exodus 3, verse 14. This verse resonates all throughout the Bible. That's why I say it's so important. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. This is the term that God reveals as his personal name. Now we've seen it. It's, it's the small cap version of the Lord. It's a special term and it's used nearly 6,000 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. It has been translated uh, as Jehovah in, in, in translations like the American Standard Version. You might have seen this uh, dem um, uh, portrayed as Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, that, that W sound typically has a V sound to it, so that, that it's Yahweh or Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, it's different vowels on the four letters, Y-H-W-H. That is God's personal name. What, what does his name mean? I am. It is based on the verb to be, to, to, be, to exist. And what God is denoting is his essence. His personal name, Yahweh, Jehovah, means I am who I am. I have always been. I always will be. In other words, God is eternal. I, I'm, we need to move on, but, but, but this is so important. And it's right here in Exodus 3, verse 14. It's so vital that we understand that God is conveying his eternality, his omnipotence. He is all powerful, all knowing, all present, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. That's what's 
packed into Exodus 3, 14. You want a name? I'll give you a name, Moses. I am who I am. The Lord, in small caps, as we see it so often, nearly 6,000 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. Very important. Well, uh, we, we're not going to read the, the rest of Exodus 3, but God is, is trying to pump Moses up and says, my right hand, my mighty hand, my outstretched arm is going to deliver the people. And Moses says, I, what if they don't believe me? And so that's moving into chapter 4, verse 1. Behold, uh, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. And God takes that excuse away from him, and he gives him a couple of signs. Uh, he, he tells him to put down his staff, and this staff becomes extremely important. It becomes its own character, as it were, in the Exodus story. And so this staff, he puts it down, and it turns into a snake. <laughs> and 80-year-old Moses goes, yikes! He's like us. He's like my wife, especially. She hates snakes. And so Moses puts this down. He also is given um, the sign of, of leprosy. Moses puts his hand into his cloak. He pulls it out. Ah, it's leprous. He puts it back in and it's restored. This is a powerful set of, of signs. And, and he's not just trying to convince the people because they, they never ask Moses for a sign. It's really a sign for Moses. Moses needs the sign. Uh, let, let me let me go back here to our chart. Um, Moses makes an excuse now. I mean, three excuses have been answered in three powerful ways by God. And so, what does he say? Well, you know, I'm I'm um, heavy of tongue is what it literally means. I'm not eloquent, and I've always I've always thought Moses was basically not telling the truth here. I mean, he wrote. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, which is a literary masterpiece. He gives great speeches throughout. I, I, I don't think he's really telling the truth. I'm, I, I, can't, I, I, I can't talk. I stutter. I, I, I'm heavy of tongue. And God takes that excuse away as well. And he says, well, your, uh, your brother Aaron, I am, I am going to uh, have him come out and meet you, and he's going to be your right-hand man. Just like a prophet uh, is to God, you are my prophet, and, uh, and so you speak for me. You're going to be as if you were God, and Aaron is your prophet. He will, he will speak for you. Okay. Well, finally, Moses makes one last excuse, and he says, I don't want to go. Send someone else, and God becomes angry with Moses. And the last uh, verse in this section, Exodus 4, verse 17, uh, tell, uh, God tells him to take in your hand this staff which you, with which you shall do the signs. Is it the staff that's powerful? No, it's the power behind the staff, God. And this staff is going to be used constantly throughout the book of Exodus, in particular in the plagues, and you see it on the screen there, Exodus 7, 15, uh, when, when God uh, turns, um, when, when, uh, when, when he presents uh, these signs to, to Pharaoh and uh, turns, turns it into a, a serpent. And then as he's unleashing the plagues, and then later when the sea is going to divide in Exodus 15 or 14, uh, the staff of God is in Moses' hand. Uh, so this staff will be used constantly. Something else I want to emphasize to you as we get going here, we've only got a few minutes left, um, but we, what we have is, is God knowing of the groaning of the people, and he says, I remember my covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. That's what God is doing here. He has already made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is going to deliver the descendants of these men, of these uh, fathers of the nation of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, uh, Joseph will have the double portion, two, two tribes, and then um, Benjamin. All right. I need to look at Exodus 6, verses 6 through 8 with you. This is God 
talking to Moses, pumping him up still. And this is so significant. We, we slow the narrative down. Uh, it's kind of picked up a little bit. Uh, and then we, we need to see this where God um, has uh, these statements. Oops, I thought it was going to highlight. I am the Lord starts and ends this little statement. And what God says is these, these statements, seven statements. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land. I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. These are significant verses because the Israelite people, even to this day, as they observe the Passover, they recite these words as they are eating the Passover. All right, we've got a lot to cover in just a few minutes. Uh, I didn't, didn't realize how slowly we were going here. Uh, Moses flees to Midian. That's in chapter 2. Uh, Israel cries out to God, and then he commissions Moses. We've looked at that very hurriedly. Moses returns to Egypt in the remainder of chapter 4, and then he confronts Pharaoh in chapter 5. It does not go well for Moses. Pharaoh... Uh, sees this sign of the snake, the the serpent, uh, the 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 staff turning into a serpent. All his magicians do that. Now, I think what Moses did is is a miracle. I think it's probably trick trickery on the part of of, of Pharaoh's magicians. But God is not to be outdone. The staff that turned into a snake. Well, that snake eats all the magician's snakes, and then Moses picks it up, and it becomes a staff again. And that's how God shows, I've got power over you. Uh, God unleashes the plagues um, very soon. But before that, uh, because things didn't go well, Moses says, oh, why'd you bring me out here? Why, God? And that's when God basically says to him, can we do this my way now? Can, can we do this? in following the steps that I'm going to give you. And finally, Moses uh, goes back to Pharaoh and thus began the series of plagues. I, I will point out in chapter five that because of Moses' um, horrible first encounter with Pharaoh, he, he ended up making the slavery even worse for the people. Um, we are not going to look at the plagues in detail. That's how we're going to go ahead and, and quit here a little early. But I want you to notice that the plagues follow a pattern. And there are three sets of three. So plagues one through nine are three sets of three. They are presented in very similar ways. Uh, plagues one, four, and seven parallel in how they are presented. It's, it's Moses going to the Nile and speaking to Pharaoh. You've got plagues two, five, and eight paralleling each other, and then plagues three, six, and nine paralleling each other. So there's that, but then there's also this progression, and the plagues just get worse and worse, the complete darkness and, and uh, that overshadows the land of Egypt. By the way, the Israelites living in the land of Goshen, they are not affected by these plagues. They are not affected by, by the darkness. And so there's this progression in the plagues. Uh, Aaron eventually uh, basically hands over uh, the, the unleashing of the plagues to his brother, to, to Moses. The magicians at first were able to keep up, but eventually once, once they reach the boils, they're affected by the boils and they say, this is the finger of God. And uh, we find out in the text of Exodus that the, these are judgments against uh, all the gods of the Egyptians. The Nile is a god to the Egyptians. And so water turned to blood. The, they have a frog god. They have all kinds of gods, um, flies, the god of flies for crying out loud. And God is just showing his power over, over all these so-called gods. What is God doing? He is unleashing judgments on the gods of Egypt. So that's something else that's taking place here. And then uh, very quickly, let me mention this to you. The plagues increase in ferocity as we go through uh, them linear, literally from uh, plague one through plague nine. 
And all along, we are told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart or that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And so after the frogs, Pharaoh said, all right, that's it. That's it. We've had enough. We're going to let the people go. Okay. And then he relents and says, nah, I'm not going to let the people go. And so the plagues uh, continue with the lice and the flies and the, the disease of the cattle and and finally, the, the, the darkness before the ultimate plague. Um, when Israel leaves, they plunder the Egyptians. This is part of God's judgment. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians when they are finally ready to leave. Uh, and, and then they're going to go into uh, the wilderness and they're going to have a lot of gold and silver and bronze and, and uh, string. Um, that's not the right word. Um, cloth, precious cloth, with which they're going to build the tabernacle. We'll talk more about that next week. So there's a lot that's going on here. Uh, and so what you see is God's judgment on the Egyptians for enslaving them, uh, enslaving the Israelites. They plundered the Egyptians. They made them destitute. And uh, people were just overwhelmed with the 10th plague, which we haven't even talked about yet. And we're almost out of time. Uh, so what you have is Moses uh, leading the people to Sinai, and they will wander in the wilderness for 40 years, more about that next week, and then they will finally make their way to Canaan. While they're at Sinai, they will do two important tasks, and we'll talk about these next week. They will establish the priesthood and will build the Ark of the Covenant, which is what we will talk about next week. All right, this plundering of the Egyptians actually had been talked about, first introduced in Exodus 3, when Moses was making his excuses. And then it happens in Exodus 12, when the people are preparing to go. You have the death of the firstborn. And uh, this is God's judgment. He says, every firstborn in the land of Egypt. This is the 10th and final plague that is commemorated in the Passover. Every firstborn in the land shall die from Pharaoh to the firstborn of the cattle. These are the firstborn male children. And, and God made a provision for Israel. Now, every plague didn't affect them, but they had to take a lamb, a, a, a one-year-old lamb without blemish, and sacrifice it and take its blood and put it on the, the doorposts. Do you know why the 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 feast or the one day um, commemoration of the Passover is called the Passover because God will pass over any of the homes that have the blood of the lamb, the sacrifice lamb. And, and so the destroyer will not kill the firstborn of the Israelites who have observed this first Passover. Uh, we could spend an entire lesson just on the Passover. Here we are tonight looking at the entire Exodus. Uh, Pharaoh is overwhelmed with grief. And so what does he do? He starts chasing the Israelites after he kind of comes to and says, oh, I'm going to get them now. But the Lord protects them. He divides the, the, the Red Sea. And the Israelites cross through the Red Sea, as it's been commemorated in many a movie, especially the Cecil B. DeMille. I remember Dee Bowman often saying that, uh, that his wife's uh, favorite Bible character in the Bible was Moses, because he looked so much like um, the character who portrayed him in, in the great Moses movie. And I've just forgotten his name. Maybe somebody can tell me that real quick. I just forgot. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, he died. Um, Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston. Is that right? Okay. Um, why was Pharaoh so successful? Why was Egypt the superpower? Because they had their chariots. Well, they get in their chariots and they start chasing after the Israelites and God overthrows their chariots. When Pharaoh drew near, he's chasing after the people, the Israelites. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. They're in their chariots, and they start complaining. But do you remember what God said in Exodus 6? I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. 
it is impossible to overestimate the significance of the exodus. I'm not suggesting here by this by this picture that Tutankhamun is is the Pharaoh. We don't know who the Pharaoh was, but all that power, all that glory, and God overthrew the superpower of the world. God did this and delivered his people. And so as we make application very quickly, what is your Egypt? What is it that is that is weighting you down, that is enslaving you? Who is the one who is behind it? Who is the one who can deliver you? And that, of course, is God. So much more we could talk about. That's a whirlwind quick look at, at the Exodus chapters 1 through 15. I'd encourage you to read all those chapters. Read the exciting story of the narrative all about the Exodus from Egypt. There'll be some things in there you'll, you'll scratch your head at and say, I'm not, I need to study that further. But you can get the gist. I encourage you to read Exodus 1 through 15. Next week, we are going to focus on the construction of the tabernacle. And I hope that you will join me next week. Bring your questions. Uh, let folks know about this live stream. They can watch it after the fact on, on my YouTube channel. Uh, let me give you uh, that real quickly. Um, and, and so I, I'd encourage you to let folks know that they can go to uh, Holy Bible Study at youtube.com and watch this live stream. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it so much. I hope you got something out of our study tonight. And um, we're out of time. So I'm going to quit and let you all get on with your weekend. Some of you are going to be enjoying a four-day weekend and hope you enjoy. Thanks so much for tuning in and watching.